thank you, Fern Cotton, for coming oh, on pleasure. Under the Skin with me, Russell Brand. I was thinking like that if me and you were doing this conversation a while ago, it would have had like quite a few layers of production involved, yeah. possibly agents and stuff. And I suppose one of the advantages of podcasts is that it becomes very uh, free. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I love it, but I struggle with it because I've done radio for so long and it is really a sort of a discipline you have to learn how the rhythm of it works and the timings and and also like you say all those layers of you know there'd be a you know a producer and then another producer and a, a unit assistant and then some other people floating around and you know that it has to sort of cohesively work as a team where with a podcast it's essentially just a chat and I love that because you get the time that you don't get on radio but I also struggle with it because I want to be all in order and neat and, oh, yes, tick that Radio 2 box, lovely. And I can't do that on this. I have to just trust and go with the flow. Um, so I find that a bit tricky. But I love, like, it's so liberating to work in this space now and to talk about whatever. You know, there are no rules. And that's why I think podcasts are so popular now because you can literally find one on any subject in the world. I've got a letter asking me to do something uh, for the old Vic, right? I've only like scanned the letter mm. a little bit. And the f the, I think it's, it's from over whoever runs the old Vic. But he says like he's staging Noel Coward's play. Wow. Like this Noel Coward play. And he says, would you write an essay for the program? Because this play I think is about celebrity and fame. And he goes and like we take the perspective that fame is a kind of trauma, like that becoming famous is a traumatic experience for people. And like, I only got this email sort of yesterday, but mm. I thought that I'd bring it up to you because mm. I think it's one of the things that uh, we think about and talk about a bit is like, that. obviously it's like something that you either, you, you know, perhaps you want before it happens or, and you feel very fortunate in some senses. But it's, it's, I'm really considering the impact it's had on me psychologically at the moment. Are you? Yeah, I think I have always chewed over that thought um, because I weirdly got into the sort of this game um, and was in the public eye to some extent from 15. So I have memories, obviously, pre being 15, but wow. a lot of it involves knowing that people are watching me or judging me or making huge assumptions and that's the only bit I've really struggled with I've kind of been really lucky and I came from a very normal background lived in you know northwest London suburbia brilliant hard-working working class parents and I'm still very much that person so I haven't ever really let it drag me kicking and screaming from who I knew I was um but I think the negatives uh, and the impact that it's had on me are all directed at my self-worth. And that's my biggest problem to this day is being defined by what other people have told me they think I am. And I, I know intellectually that that's bollocks and that, you know, I don't need to listen to Richard from Rotherham telling me that I'm a plonker. But I've had it for so long and at times in a really sort of magnified way that I think it has affected my self-worth. So all the the trappings of fame, whatever, have bypassed me. I've never been interested in it. I've never gone down that road. I think just because I had that sort of sense of normality before that I wanted to stay true to. Um, but the negative impact it's had on me is definitely beating myself up and using sort of conflating other people's uh, they might not even be opinions. It might have been a flippant throwaway thought, but conflating that with my own thoughts about myself. And I still have to really work on that one to this day. And I've been doing this for 22 years. Wow. So that's the impact it's had on me. But look, I've seen all the plonkers and the pitfalls over the years and people go off on weird routes because of fame. And I've thought, oh, I don't fancy that very much. And I, you know, I've made loads of cock-ups and mistakes. Obviously, everyone has. But... I can see the impact it's had in a negative way and it's only on my on my self-worth. It's interesting that the the your podcast Happy Place as sort of it feels like because like people start podcasts it might go well might not but yours it seems has done really particularly extraordinarily well with the uh, with the idea of having guests that you want to 
learn something from some people really well known some people less well known what is it that your what is your guiding idea behind the podcast what made you want to do it and um well there's two different i guess there's two different answers so the, so the th- first thing is sort of why i wanted to do it um i had this sort of big um life and career change and it wasn't particularly staged or thought about but there was stuff going on in my own life and i'd been in a pretty weird place and um, and then I'd had children and I decided to leave Radio 1, which was kind of really my identity at that point. And um, I thought, right, there's kind of this character person that I've built or while I'm doing TV and radio, I'm not being properly me. I'm being probably like 40% me. But there's all this other stuff that I don't really talk about. Why don't I talk about it? So then... The idea sort of came about writing a book about a particularly dark episode that I'd had in my life and and how I've sort of moved on from it or work with it still. Um, what book? Which one is that? This was Happy, the I've first one. I've got your three books here. Well, thank you very much for displaying They look good together them. As They're as really well. pretty, aren't they? Yeah, They're they look very amazing. pretty. So Quiet, Happy was the happy, first calm. one. Yeah. Quiet's the most recent. Quiet's the most recent. So Happy was the first one. It's all about depression um, and not feeling great and what I'd personally experienced. And, um, and then... In the book, I interview lots of people that I really like or whose opinions I value. And I thought, well, rather than just write down these interviews, surely I should be having these conversations. And I started off doing a little tester one with my mate Zephyr Wildman, who's this amazing yoga teacher who lost her husband um, to addiction. And um, she's become a very great friend of mine. And we talked about her losing her husband and the impact it's had on her and her children and and it was just a little test, like, how's this working as a conversation? And then um, and then I, I said to Dawn French on Twitter, will you come on my podcast that doesn't exist yet? And she was like, if you can come to Cornwall, I thought, I fancy a day by the sea. So once we had Dawn, other people were like, oh, that obviously must be a thing. So then other people started saying yes. Um, and I think why people listen to it and like it um, is because we look at, you know, whether it is famous people or not, we we view other people like having it all sussed, like, oh, that person seems really robust and resilient to stuff going on and like, what's their secret? Whereas obviously underneath it all, like, you unpick all those life circumstances and emotions and we're all feeling the same feelings, you know, from varying degrees, but we're struggling or we're joyful or we're curious or we're not understanding things and that fascinates me more than anything so my my drive to do it is always unpicking how that person works and also trying to find a common ground with my own struggles and you know weird idiosyncrasies like does someone else feel like that and if they do that's going to make me feel better and hopefully lots of other people out there so it's just about it's just a chat about that, cutting through all the small talk of, oh, I like your shoes, how was your holiday? And just going, I don't like that small talk bit. I don't feel comfortable in it. I like going into the deep bit. And it, that is essentially how the podcast was born. You seem on it very inquisitive and like it's a, um, that it's a personal quest it doesn't it feel like oh someone's given me some money to do this and no, so i'll just as say we know whatever. there is no money in podcasts it's very difficult to monetize <laughs> and that's why i'm advertising you know their minds that get bits for iphones <laughs> yeah. advertise them they're good their minds <laughs> give them a break you know like little kids work down there there's nothing wrong with it them kids enjoy it it's good for their make something their fiddles fiddles <laughs> those kids <laughs> if i overcome this they could rise to the top mm. um so like, um, right, so it comes from a genuine inquiry. I'm thinking yeah. about it while you're talking about it. The fact that we are used to seeing you in more structured mainstream media, for me, hearing you, like the ac- having access to that other 60%, not the 40% of yourself you say you w- were comfortable using on Radio 1 or the TV stuff that we're used to seeing you on, it gives it a sense of, I think, emotional authenticity. Well, I hope so, because... I love doing all those other bits that I've done over the years and that I still do now when I'm on Radio 2 or whatever, but you do feel a sense of relief when you can write a real honest book or talk really authentically in a podcast because you can't really go wrong. There's no massive mistake that can be made because you're just being you, whereas in the other space where you're working for other people or you are fulfilling a role that, 
you know, anyone could do in that profession. You need to be on board with that. And I think I've always felt very nervous in that space that I was going to say something that was deemed inappropriate or someone would think that if I mentioned that I had had a, you know, had episodes of depression that I would be, you know, not be hired again or whatever. And when I'm just talking about it openly in my own space, I feel so comfortable and such a relief and such liberation. And like you say, it is a personal quest. I, this is not just me in my professional life. This is my whole world now is wanting to talk to interesting people from whatever walks of life to try and understand their life and their perspective to get more of a grip on my own because I don't feel like I have really scratched the surface you know I'm starting to work out my patterns and my triggers and how I work but there's so much more I want to learn I think you only do that by bouncing off other people and reacting off other people yes when you say that I feel that um that um celebrity is just an amplification of if something that any like that happens in ordinary or non-famous life in that say for example you start to learn oh don't show those bits of your personality because people don't like that that's not rewarded but we all know that from socializing i didn't for me it took ages and ages to really diligently try and get famous for ages like 10 years and years of doing it so like during that time i suppose i had I've got more of a, like, you know, someone like you that's been in the public eye from 15, it must be hard. It must have been present when you were going through, like, you know, becoming an adult, becoming you know, like all of those different transitions that we go through have been with the accompaniment of fame. But regardless of whether or not you're in the public eye, people know what it's like to conceal of an course. aspect of yourself. Yeah, of course. Like if you're if, at work, people don't want to show their true colours in case they're judged or in social situations in case we feel excluded and no one wants to feel alienated, excluded, like they're not part of a pack. None of us want to feel that. So I think we do end up hiding bits of ourselves and the beautiful thing that's happened in the last I mean five years really because it's been happening prior to that but the last five years when people have really been talking about not just mental health but just really being vulnerable and and talking about emotions and and fears and problems I think that is the most powerful thing because you instantly don't feel alone. You know that that weird thing that always happens in your head or that weird physical thing you worry about, other people are feeling, oh my God, there's no greater relief. And and I had that with Happy. I was shit scared about that book being published. And the night before it went on sale, I was just like catatonic with fear. Like, oh, this book cannot go out. No one can read this book. This is a massive mistake. And then as soon as I started to sort of talk to other people about it and once I'd had a sort of reaction from it being released I was like oh my god this is actually the greatest thing because other people are coming up to me who I had no idea had had any sort of mental health problem or or you know down in life and had come to me and said oh my god I you should have said I was going through exactly the same thing or oh, I had that after I had kids or whatever and it's that connection that I think is driving a lot of what I do now and and also socially I think so many more people are feeling comfortable talking about things not everything but I think we're we're getting there and it's going to be an incremental thing over the years where hopefully somewhere down the line we'll be happy to talk about any old thing and there won't be any more taboo subjects or things that we feel ashamed about or concerned about that we don't need to carry shame and all of that as a burden on top of all the other stuff that we're experiencing. Because so it was the opposite reaction. You felt that a b- book where you talked about your uh, feelings of depression or inadequacy. You felt that it. What What was your fear? Um, that I that everything in my head would be confirmed that I mm. was a bit odd, um, that I wasn't deserving of anything that I'd achieved or any um, accolades I may have been given. Not that I defined by them at all, but I just think I was very worried that they might be taken away because. You know, I have um, been in situations where I haven't been my best at work or um, I've been not been feeling great mentally and therefore not given all that I could. And I have been ridiculed and um, or called out. And and that's made me really fearful of showing that side of myself. Um, And, you know, like so in calm, that's all about 
anxiety and, and panic attacks. And panic attacks are a bit more, they're sort of newer to me. That's in the last sort of three years that I've had panic attacks. And, um, and I've had them when I've been on air and managed to somehow sort of conceal them. Whereas I think if I was like, if I felt like I was having one now, I'd say, you know what, Russell, can I go out the room for five minutes? And just because I'm having, I have this thing and I get very breathless and very hot. Do you mind if I take five? Whereas before I wrote that book, I would be full of shame and embarrassment and thinking, oh God, he's not feeling panicked. He's all calm and cool about everything. And I'm this you know, freak who's worrying about nothing. And, you know, I think being able to just be honest and, and say those things and then deal with them as they're happening is a relief. And again, that book was a catharsis because I was just getting it out on paper rather than internalising it and, and feeling even more sort of alienated in what I was experiencing. You see how you said that you'd like uh, narrativize the panic, like that it's not enough to just feel the respiratory condition, the mm. heat. Then you start saying, oh, other people don't yeah. feel it and I'm bad for feeling it. Like the, the now that you are doing sort of podcasts that are about well-being and I think make it creating a really interesting space in podcasts, I don't think anyone else doing, or at least they're not doing as popularly or as well. Um, and now with your and also with your publishing moving into this space, do you think it's a way of you relating differently to your own, to your own anxiety yeah. and your own panic and stuff? It's a way of me relating differently to myself because when I didn't feel like I fit into certain parts of the career I was working in, I felt like, like I was there was something wrong with me. You know, um, well, like if you have to go to a, a shindig. A shindig or, you know, I've sat in countless meetings where I've been sat in front of a commissioner and and they've gone, oh, what have you been up to recently? And I've panicked and gone, oh, God, well, I, you know, I did that <laughs> show the other day and, you know, and I sort of forget. And I think, and then I walk out going, that was horrible. <laughs> that was horrible. They haven't taken any time to look at what I've done for two decades and I haven't been able to justify myself and they don't they don't hire me anyway so I walk away feeling lesser than and I don't have to do that anymore for a start I don't go Ooh. to those meetings anymore I don't want to but also I am learning through all of this work that I'm doing you know I've sort of used the podcast and the books as like my own free therapy in a sense because I'm saying things out loud, I think writing things down is incredibly powerful. So I'm venting all of this stuff and it's coming out in books, podcasts, whatever medium, it doesn't matter. And I'm figuring it out. So going back to your question, I can sort of relate to who I am through all of this um, and what I thought was wrong with me or what I still do believe isn't enough because I st that's not like, oh, I'm cured now. I've written these books and I do these podcasts and everything's great. No, every day is like, you know, I'm berating myself about things or self-flagellation involved or whatever. And I'm trying to do that less and just like exactly who I am with all of my you know, weird bits and good bits and, and the mistakes I've made. And and that's something I find tricky in this day and age is it's, it's sort of like we're not allowed to make mistakes, you know, because of social media. I'm not, I'm not blaming, I love social media, but because of how it works and how we view other people, to make a mistake, or also if you're in the public eye, you make a tiny mistake and you are absolutely ridiculed, taken down, called name under the sun. There are no humans who, without mistakes, it's not possible. And also to make a mistake then gives you the opportunity to grow. So we're kind of missing a trick there. We're, we're not going, God, right, you made a mistake and, and I'm interested to see how you turn around from that. We just knock people about and then in turn do it to ourselves. We make a mistake, we beat the shit out of ourselves because of it. But really we have to make mistakes. Like that is so, so important. So. I'm only getting to grips with that now. You know, my late 30s, I'm starting to understand the mistakes that I have made and that have caused me sleepless nights and all sorts of anxiety is to now go, doesn't matter. Like, look what I did after it. What happened after the mistake? Where did I go next? And what did I learn? And did I do it again? And if I did it again, what did I learn again on top of that? And did I then hopefully not do it again? And to use it rather than we're so quick to go, hmm, you fucked up. And then to ourselves go, oh my God, 
and fucking up all the time, you know? And like, that's, I think, such a, a problem for so many of us is that constant beating ourselves up about stuff. Because I feel like what this yeah, enables us to do, um, see, seeing you undertake this journey somewhat publicly, is for us to compare the tension that we all feel about, oh, this is what people think of me, or this, and this is what I think of myself. It's good to feel that relief, because like when I see you hanging out with uh, Laura, your friend, my wife, uh, I sort of think, oh, it's like Fern's like happy and together and cool. Or if I'm with you and Jesse, uh, my friend, your husband, then like it seems everything's conducted on a level where I don't imagine. I always, um, as you said earlier, that the sort of neurosis is somehow exclusive to me. I don't, not intellectually, but just per- em- empirically when I feel it, I think, oh God, no one feels this desperate <laughs> and shameful and awful. I can't, you know, like, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's an invitation, I suppose, this kind of pop, popular uh, access to therapeutic language and I think spiritual language is an invitation to sort of normalize it and make it something that we communicate about instead of defaulting to saying the best things about ourselves. It's interesting as well because I recognize that that, that what you know a high pressure meeting and someone just asks you an offhand question thinking oh god I don't know what to say and like suddenly hearing the thing that I'm saying like this isn't what I'm meant to be saying (laughs) at all why am I saying this now and wanting to sort of pile the words back in again (laughs) do you think that now I know that interestingly you said you wouldn't put yourself in that position now of going to like sort of situations where you feel you might be judged but do you feel you are different do you because like they say don't they that the technique would be remain present because if you remain present when you feel intimidated and afraid, you would have the access to the idea that the ultimate reality is, you know, you're in limitless space. You're <laughs> yeah, yeah, a yeah. conscious being there, a conscious being. He's going to die. Or presumably it was a man in that example. I don't know. It could have been a female. It, it was a female in the one that I was actually visualising. That's there, my, I've been in many, many situations like it. My sexism exposed there, not for the first, <laughs> possibly not for the last time. Um, so like, uh, but do you think that now you would be able to use these techniques, which... Mm. Uh, to allay that sometimes sometimes I can get present enough to negate all of the mental bullshit that I'm bombarded with but sometimes I'm not and it's too powerful and that's when I can that's the sort of space where I have the tendency to spiral and if I'm going to go into a negative spiral it's then and it could be a moment where someone catches me off guard or I've been in a conversation where I felt flustered and I, I'm i not being authentic and I'm not saying things that I truly believe mm. and I'll walk away, then go into self-loathing, beat myself up. Then I get stuck. So my head just gets stuck in that and I, and I can... I can sort of rationalise what's going on and I can intellectually understand what's going on, but I can't get out of it or act on it. I'm sort of stuck. And that at times has gone on for, oh, I had my, my, the time I write about in Happy, I'm kind of non-specific because I'm not quite at peace with any of it yet. So I don't (laughs) ever go into like explicit details because I'm still trying to get to peace with it all. Because it's private. Yeah, and also... I think later down the line, like say I'm 70 and I'm still hopefully doing this sort of thing, I might go, let me tell you exactly what that was about. But I'm not there yet. But you're able to admit that there are things that still have power. Loads. I suppose as well, again, because I suppose if there's things like to do with like, like I've had relationships that have been in public and like, so I'll always have to be cautious about that because of protecting that person and because of the kind of things that people might say about it and stuff. And so I think in, in that sense, it's, probably wise to and not necessary to yeah and that other thing that i've had a tendency to do like it's almost the other extreme of what you're saying about feeling isolated by neurosis is over tell people Mm. and like something i don't mean i don't even who are these people i'm telling this stuff they Mm. don't love me Mm. yeah i i find myself also doing that um because i really want to like get them to feel that there's a connection between us and i force it too much but (sighs) i think you know 
some of the times, yes, you're right. You know, don't say things if you think it's going to have a negative effect on someone else publicly. But also for myself, you know, if I don't feel completely at peace with some of my past or situations that I've been in, I don't want to start talking about them publicly because I feel too vulnerable to. I'm not there yet. The things that I've talked about in the three books or on the podcast, I'm completely comfortable talking about. That's good. I, I love talking about them because, again, it's that connectivity and and deeper understanding of 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 everyone and of of, of ourselves in turn um but you know in that in that specific book i wrote that off the back some way further down the line off the back of a good year of feeling stuck really stuck for like a year could have been longer it's all a blur because i'm still getting memories back and you know it was a real sort of awful time what for me what were you doing at the time to try and get rid of it do you know what i mean we Drinking Lots of things. No, like, luckily, you, you I've got I've got quite an addictive personality, but it's never led me down the route of drink or drugs, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, you know, my husband, like yourself, is in recovery, and I've watched that process, and it's obviously very complex and takes a lot of discipline. And luckily, I've never been down that road. But the obsessiveness probably comes in the form of the self-loathing and the getting stuck and reaching habitually for negative thoughts rather than positive ones. What do you do? How do you interrupt that now? Say something happens to you, you feel that negativity or fear or whatever it is. What is your, how, what techniques do you use to intervene in your thinking? It depends how good I'm feeling. Like on a bad day, I'm obviously like eating biscuits out of the cupboard and I'm trying to make it go away. Maybe shout at someone. Yeah, probably Jesse. Give Jesse a yeah, good going Jessie's over. Yeah, Jesse's probably pissed me off because the recycling's not been done. It's something very banal and <laughs> all the kids are playing up and I'm actually being too unfair and strict on them when I shouldn't. And that's when I really don't like it. That's when I go, wait, I shouldn't be doing that. Right. Um, but on a good day, if I'm feeling balanced and good and something throws me, then my go-to thing is talk to someone else instantly. I'm not normally strong enough to just deal with it why should you myself? be? Yeah, I guess that's the beauty of being a human, isn't it? Like we can bounce off each other and we can have ideas and and we can listen. So important. So I will text a great friend. It might be your Laura. It might be my friend Claire. Um, I see a therapist. It could be a therapist. Um, yeah. And I will say this. This is what's happened. This is what I'm feeling like. You know, usually like, is that normal? I always think that I'm a freak or I'm thinking in an absurd way and get to a point where hopefully I can really rationalise what's going on. And then and then if I'm feeling good about that, basic things like, you know, I like going walking and being outside. I like running. I like doing exercise um, or it might be just trying to replace a shitty thought with a nice one. So, you know, whether you call them mantras you know, yeah. affirmations, whatever, yeah. just telling myself, it's usually, you know, I am enough or, you know, I am okay or whatever, because I, my default setting is that I'm not. Yeah. So I have to do basic building blocks of you're all right. It hasn't got to get any more exciting than that. Just you're all right. And then we just continue the day and hope for the best. And sometimes I have to just sit it out and not be stuck anymore. And that might be after, usually it's quicker these days, two, three days. And then, oh, feel all right today let's crack on but then I have to watch that I don't go into a crazy high which is oh I'm feeling amazing and I'm going to be sprinkling in the whole house and I'm going to be you know playing with the kids in the garden for two hours and I'm going to go and do some emails and I try and do way too much and then knacker myself out and I end up back where I was so it's a balancing act I think of uh, looking at your own barometer and working out where you should sit Sometimes I feel a real big high and what I do is I think, my God, I'm invincible. <laughs> I can do anything. And I set up loads of meetings and that. Oh, yeah. And then people start to go, yeah, all right, we'll have them. And I don't want them. these meetings. What do you want them? I can't go up there. They'll judge me. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm not sitting in there with them asking me what I've been doing lately. And then me going, I don't know, put the bins out <laughs> yeah. this morning. I think it's keeping it simple, isn't it? That's what my new mantra has been over the last few years is keep things simple I didn't want simple before I wanted complicated yeah, I exciting all I mm. wanted was a roller coaster so 
certainly in my 20s, I didn't care what was going on as long as it was an extreme high. Where do you think we scary. get that idea from, Fern? Like um, that things should be complicated and excited. Why, why do we think that? Why do we think it's got to be really dramatic and mm, exciting? Well, there's a few things. I think my mum is that way inclined, so I probably by osmosis got a bit of that. She likes a bit of drama, does she, She mum? loves a bit of drama. She still does. And I don't think I'm talking out of turn saying that. I hope I'm not. Um, but I think a bit my mum. But also... Um, I guess I had this huge high at 15. I felt like I'd sort of been plucked from suburban obscurity and put on the telly and I never really got over that, that there was this crazy, amazing thing that had happened to me that I could never have imagined. Um, and obviously I'd done like, my God, how many very bad TV adverts before that, theatre productions, or whatever, for three or four years and and countless drama classes from the age of like, I don't know, 10 before that. Yeah. But... Um, but it still felt absurd. So I think that kick-started a bit of a, a you know, I want to chase that. Oh, what's the next one of that that I'm going <laughs> to get? And also that meaning something. Like, oh, that must mean I'm doing something. And it's that whole thing of, you know, we're human beings, not human doings. We, but I'm always more content or comfort in the doing bit. If I'm constantly doing and, uh, you know, achieving or even if it's just like I've done the laundry, yay, good, you know, good for me. I get like a little internal tick and I think, and I'm not talking about a tick, I'm talking about like a yeah, yeah, positive, this, yay, this well a done. No, not a twitch. It's not like a little a, spasm <laughs> every time spasm. you go to the laundry. No, I would never do laundry again. This is very much like an internal bit of praise and I think I've always chased that to some extent and I don't know, it's chicken and egg, I don't know if that was because of the career high immediately or... Or if that was there prior to that, I don't know. Um, mm. I'm a real doer and that serves me well, but it also hinders me massively when I need to just do the being bit. I'm not very good at that. When you're learning this stuff now, as you move more into personal development, which I think is a good thing for people, because I'm sort of doing a comparable thing. I've been like involved in entertainment a lot. Stand-up comedy gives you some latitude <clears throat> if you know if people see it, but I mean to say you're not, beholden to a, a broadcaster's agenda or some other corporate Yeah, you've got autonomy agenda. on what you're doing. You've got autonomy. As I move more in this direction, I'm aware that uh, one of the things will be levelled at both you and I because of celebrity background and class background mm. is that the areas we're moving into have got deep esoteric underwriting like when we're talking like some of the things you're talking about in calm and quiet and happy necessarily overlap with ideas that are in christianity mm, they're not new ideas Buddhism. no they've got to there are no new ideas no, no, i don't no, think no. certainly not here mm. but like don't you um how do you feel about that and excuse me burping what is your interest in looking into those sorts of roots as in I, I mean to say like you know aspects of buddhism or yeah. aspects of what's your interest in i that? don't identify um purely with any one religion or methodology but i'm fascinated by all of them and i do think a bit of um the sort of storytelling of religion is really beautiful. And I think stories are an incredibly sort of powerful way of us understanding ourselves and life. Um, I, it's such a weird one to sort of define because I hate to go, oh yeah, I'm spiritual because you sound like a bit of a wanker. But I, but I do, um, I do sort of, I, I am spiritual. I believe that there is a greater something out there, whether that's within or exterior, I don't know. But I believe that there are, you know, miraculous things that happen or synergy between you and other people, you know, mad coincidences, whatever it might be. Um, and, the, and the mistakes and the learning also comes into that and how you take that on. So, you know, I don't sort of relay any particular religious structure in any of these books, but I think... I'd be silly to say I'm not taking bits of them or or looking at them and then trying to make sense of them myself. Um, That's what needs to happen. I think a yeah. lot of these ideas need to be liberated, popularised and what I want to say, um, sort of modernised, but just ac made accessible. And I think that is what you're doing. And I think that it's a really good uh, like journey to go on. Something that we just would unthinkingly coll colloquially say, like I don't like myself yeah I, you know i like you know and even thoughts of suicide at the extreme end of mm. that i've been thinking lately how the annihilation and loss of self is the aim 
of many meditative and uh, spiritual disciplines. Yeah. That, that, that the Buddhist idea that yourself is a construct, uh, just biochemical drives that you respond to, memories that you over-identify with, that the human being, like you just said, that human being doing thing, that the human being is an event as opposed to an object. It's an ongoing thing. You don't need to continually relate to certain aspects of your past. Like, oh, I'm that person who did that thing. You can just go, right, I'm not going to place significance on that in the same way that I used to. That you can reorder, reorganize yourself. The sort of 12 step stuff that I'm into is yeah. the reason I believe in it is because it's about change. Like, change is what's necessary. And if you, you know, are unable to live with yourself successfully, then obviously change is necessary. So, like, that. What I mean to say is that I think it's good that you present these things in a popular and accessible way. But I think it is also important that we know, not for any judgmental reason, but because it's nice to know that there is a tradition yeah. like, that you can reach <clears throat> deep down into. Absolutely. And also, I think the fundamental thing about religion that that is nice to popularise and put out there, because there obviously are sort of, there can be negatives, because otherwise there wouldn't be so many wars and stuff going on. But but. The positive is hope. And if you're not attached to a religion, it's hard to be hopeful sometimes, to have faith in whatever it is, in good stuff happening. And if you are self-loathing and you don't like yourself, you have to have hope. That's the first step, surely, of like getting out of that mindset. Yes. You hope that you can think in a different way. You have faith that you will find strength somewhere down the line to not act in the habitual bad patterns you've got yourself into. So if that's your only attachment to a religion, then let that be it. And and you don't have to be religious to have hope and faith. It's just working out how you, you know, fit that into your life. How does that slot into your everyday life that you have, you wake up in the morning and there is faith that you're not going to get hit by a bus or faith that it's going to be an okay day. So for me, it's the connection to that bit of it that I'm interested in is what is faith? What is hope? Where, you know, does that come from self-love confidence or is it just an idea that we have to grab hold of i'm i'm not sure but i i'm fascinated by what that means and how we can implement it into it, our lives it might come that implementation i reckon i'm just making this up now <laughs> from uh, like when you feel that feeling of oh i'm not worth anything or whatever that that, that sort of has a sense there's an openness to that like say if you go beyond self-condemnation to the acknowledgement of, oh, wow, maybe I'm actually just a construct. Maybe I'm, you know, oh, I just happen to have been born in this time, this gender, this mm. class, this culture. But what is this essence? What is this witness? And maybe the, that idea of faith, if you can get past that, oh, I hate myself, I'm worthless, I'm not as good as other people, to the point of, oh, well, all people are constructs. Uh, perhaps on the other side of the self-condemnation is the access to the idea of change, of as you say, hope, you know, faith, I feel might be accessible there. It was a thing that just occurred yeah. to me just then, Fern. I think that's what it is because, you know, it's really hard to sit with all of the, the we all have darkness within us, you know, whether that be internal problems or, you know, just we, we all have a darkness. And I think it's sort of accepting that, but then having faith, you know, as you say, like sort of in communities, in groups, whether that be friendships at work, at school, whatever, that you can create change either individually or in a, a, a positive movement. And I'm not trying to create any new movement with my books necessarily, Why? but I am. Well, because that seems like a little bit grand, Rain. but I think I'm certainly wanting to, you know, who continue. Do you anyone who feels a bit like, you know, alienated and 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 like they're not part of something. Any, anyone who feels like I have for, a, you know, a substantial part of my adult life um for them to feel not like that because you don't need to it's pointless what was it like when you do the mind like you're ambassador for mind yeah. the mental health yeah. organization mm. uh, did you go and do sort of like some of their community group experiences mm. and stuff like that yeah what, i've that had like? some amazing one well, I'm, I'm very very lucky in the fact that i i work with mind and i absolutely adore what they do and also um i've just been made a goodwill ambassador for the prince's trust with my focus being mental well-being which is that is that the prince amazing. of wales prince charles yeah yeah so i've been an ambassador for a few years but i've sort of been given a new role which is really exciting and um and their work is unreal how like you know i've met so many young people who's you know that sort of game-changing phrase is thrown about but my god i've met kids who have been you know, absolute desperate 
points of life and now they have thriving business plans up and running and just amazing stories but <clears throat> with mind one of the first things i did was went to mind in hackney because local mines all over the place and you can drop in and they've got lots of different things going on there um, to support you or just to help you get out of the house if you have terrible social anxiety, um, all manner of things. And I went to a Mind Hackney group that was running that was um, sort of spoken word therapy. And <clears throat> I was shitting myself. It was um, it was sold to me as this is sort of like spoken word and rap. Ooh, <clears throat> am I going to have to do a rap? That's what that I'm thinking is, now. And obviously i'm not a rapper like it doesn't come naturally You've never to me. claimed to be a rapper I've never claimed to be a rapper to be fair it's not a part of my career path that i'm focusing on right now but i went into this thinking oh, i'm just gonna throw myself into it and i want to give it a go and it was one of the most beautiful afternoons i have had ever it was incredible went into this room there's about 20 of us sat there, all from Is different it church hall or something? It or... was sort of just like a little, like a scout hut, you know, like a, just a little mm. scout hut on the side of the road. And we've got a lovely little tea area, a little canteeny bit. And then this big communal space is about 20 of us sat around, all from different backgrounds, different ages, um, massively mixed bag of people sat in this room. And we, and this brilliant lady who I've befriended, because I, uh, I can't stop becoming friends with these amazing people that I'm, I, I sort of force myself upon them. Like you, you're going to be my new mate because I think you're amazing. This lady called Wanda, who is, uh, she's a rapper, um, <laughs> but also does, you know, poetry, spoken word. You've got your rap in common. I've got my rap You can bond exactly. with Wanda on your mutual exactly. love of rap. Um, so she led this class with such empathy, compassion, sensitivity, by the end of it, I was like, I'll do my poem. Because at the beginning, I was like, I'm not talking. I'm not even going to write a poem. By the end, we all wanted to get up and share these little, it could be a verse that we'd written, because we were instantly seeing this connection. By the end of it, we were all like, hugging and laughing. And the lady next to me, we were sort of, I was sort of sat on her lap hugging her. And How did Wanda get it from feeling cold and atomized mm, in the scout up I think, to that? What was the, can you remember the bit where you got sort of lured in yeah, there and thought, I'm happy yeah. to go with this now? I mean, she was just a special person. I think some people have that quality where they can bond a room and it's really hard to do. Um, and she's actually been on my podcast since because I was so fascinated by her. But she got a ball of string and she held it and she held on to the, end, the loose end and she threw the ball to somebody else and they had to say something about themselves and then that person threw it to somebody else. And we just went round the room and it was either we had to say something about ourselves or... Are you all right being compassionate in them situations? You're not judgmental. You're not thinking, oh, I don't like him. No, or, no, no like way. Him. You're no, all right my, with that. My default setting is they all think I'm a twat. That's right, my default you're worried about setting. what they think about like you. Oh yeah, my default setting is they, oh, they, they, like they think I'm a fucking they twat. They like children telly. need. Yeah, they, they just think I'm a pudgy. dickhead. There's nothing wrong with that eye. Yeah, all of that. It's all going on in my head. So my judge, judgmental side is always about myself. self persecuting not others. I rarely judge other people because I so dislike parts of myself. That's my hurdle. Right. So we threw this ball of string... And we all, and then we looked and we'd said a bit about ourselves. And we, this is lovely little moment where we sat there and there was all this string going between us, like a little network, a spaghetti junction of string between us all. And quite tangibly, there was our connection. And we'd all listen to each other. And it was like, wow, yeah, we've, it, was, it was something like we all got something in common. So, you know, I like fishing, throw it to the next person. I've been swimming before, you know, something as sort of tenuous as that. But we could see the connection that we all had similarities, no matter what our problem was, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, you know, acute social anxiety, whatever. We all had a connection and and then we trusted each other and it was lovely. That is very beautiful. Did some people visibly find it very difficult to participate in that exercise? Yes, but... Um, but everybody got up and everybody spoke. And there was a woman there that hadn't... She'd been to one of Wanda's courses previously. This was, I think, her second or third or something like that. But before she'd been to a, a, a local mind and before she'd been to one of Wanda's workshops, she hadn't left the house in eight years Bloody at hell. all. At all. And and she... Her poetry was incredible because she, she was channeling every bit of that darkness and fear and 
whatever whatever other emotions were stopping her from living a normal life she put into this beautiful poetry and and some of the other people that had been on her courses before were going to open mic nights and these mm. are people that felt completely um ill at ease with themselves prior to stepping into this local mind so so the work they do is exceptional and that also massively drives a lot of what I'm doing because I've met so many amazing people where I've seen they've been in a very dark place and they've they've got themselves out of it. Sometimes I feel like that you have to, uh, like, I feel like, I hear stories like that, like I think, oh my God, yeah, that's really good. Mind are doing this positive thing. There's that woman who ain't been out for eight years. Now she's doing them poems. Oh, that's good. And she's communicating something in herself yeah. that make her feel better and all of that. And then I think sometimes, Fern, of the scale of the problem and how diffuse it is, uh, like how many people, how many people won't find access to that mind, won't have the confidence to go to it. And I feel, and it, then this is how my domino mind unravels, yeah. is that I feel like, why do we live in a society that doesn't prioritise that above some of the other things that we prioritise and some of the things that you and I you know, all, all of us really participate in because we live in a world that's so much about commodification, yep. commercialization. <clears throat> and like when there are characters like Wanda, or I met someone uh, the other day, this woman, Mandy, that runs houses for women in recovery, a lot of women that have been in institutions or whatever. And like, she's just got boundless energy yeah. for helping. And you make me think, oh my God, you don't have to do everything yourself. This Mandy person or Wanda or whatever, They'll do it. All you have to do is support them. But yeah. usually those people are doing it without enough funds. I know. You know, so, so somewhat maligned. Even like a successful charity like Mind. My sense is, why are we not culturally and socially promoting these values? And what do you feel an obligation to? And do you think we can influence it? I don't feel an obligation. I feel extreme passion that I want oh. to. Um, but um, looking at the whys behind why we're possibly struggling the most we ever have culturally, and we kind of are because like Princess Trust have a youth index that comes out and, you know, uh, young young people are the most anxious and depressed uh, and, and having more panic attacks than ever. And it's sort of plateaued for the last couple of years. And um, I think... What, for one, there's a lot of archaic systems that probably need to definitely change, uh, you know, globally, obviously, um, and how we are so focused on um, buying crap that we don't need and, and that meaning something and having a part of our identity. Also, probably the schooling system. Um, and I know it's under stress anyway, but I think, uh, you know, there is a lot of room for change at schools and perhaps the curriculum needs to be slightly more malleable in today's times and there should be more focus on just general well-being um and soft skills as well as the academic because don't you think like people like us that have like lottery winners in a sense not that you know like you said you worked hard and yeah, but i'm lucky know, I, I had a lucky, lucky moment you had a lucky moment i've had lucky loads of lucky moments and we're still like going, oh, we're feeling insane in the membrane because yeah, of, of all the social pressure and the anxiety and judging ourselves and how fame exacerbated our natural tendencies to care too much what other people think of you. And then, you know, you say something and then you see it everywhere yeah. and you make a mistake and people do this, you know, like, then what must it be like for the people that are from backgrounds that we're from who don't ever get the opportunities that we get have had and that's getting multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and it feels like that there are such big like the kind of values that you're talking about here uh, in, 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 in say for example your book uh, Quiet your new book or the kind of conversations you're having with uh, I listened to the one with Davina McCall today or you know like uh, like you said you've had them with Wanda and a variety of uh, people like I feel like we the, they, they, it's odd that, that both Mind, which is an amazing organisation, Prince's Trust, from what you're telling me, sounds like also an amazing organisation. I don't know as much about it. Like, it's become the interest of sort of charitable organisations yeah. as opposed <clears throat> the to the government. That, yeah, the Ooh. fundamental building blocks of yeah. what a nation is. Well, what is a nation? I, I, I guess. 
over time, politically, priorities have become slight and globally just become slightly warped. Um, and if we all felt mentally more at ease, there would, of course, be less problems in every area of life. And I guess the only thing we can do is something we can do as parents, of course, with our generation of children. Um, and we're still going to make mistakes and have days where we're not the greatest parents. But I think fundamentally, if we are teaching our kids to grow up um you know, having self-worth that isn't dependent yeah. on how many likes they get on a Instagram post or by how popular they are or whatever, then that's a great start. And also, you know, it's a tricky one to talk about, but mindfulness, you know, it gets battered about so much and there's not as much understanding around it as there needs to be because people go, oh, I don't like meditating, full stop. And it's so not that. It's like you said before, just being more present or being aware of what is going on around you rather than projecting to the future, you know, looking back into the past, panicking about all of those things and getting our kids. I mean, they naturally do it as small kids and then they start to come out of that phase. I don't know when they're teenagers or maybe earlier now because of social media. And I think it's just introducing a bit of that into the home but also into school life for you know schools to encourage kids to be more mindful of what's going on rather than oh you didn't pass that so that means you failed that and you have no opportunities in this area that's that that was me I wasn't an academic kid what was that the 11 plus mine was my GCSEs and I was already working at this point so I was really confused as to what I should be focusing on but I really liked my job and I was... I could pass this GCSE yes, or I or could it's... fuck you and become <laughs> a star. Yes, yes. At a lesser level, because at this point I was sort of like doing the Disney Club, you know, introducing cartoons on the TV. Right, we so it wasn't the heady heights, but it was... Ready to tear up the GCSE not and quite. Ferris Bueller your way out of there. Not quite, but it was exciting nonetheless. And I, and I was trying to do a bit of both, but... I guess the sort of naive and very excited part of me channeled everything into work. And I did okay in my in my studies, but I was never naturally academic and I didn't put any energy into it at all. Now I'm an adult. Oh my God, I'm, a, I'm addicted to learning. It's all I want to do is learn more about, you know, what I'm passionate about, but things that I don't know so much about, I want to just keep learning and I didn't really have the thirst for it then. So, you know, I'd go into these talks you have with um, the people that project what your future's going to be like, careers whatever they're yeah, called, yeah, advisors. And um, and th and they'd do a sort of a weird questionnaire that would end up with, you should work with children or be a teacher. And I'd think, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be a teacher. That's not for me. I, that's You're not speaking to me. You haven't looked at what I've written down here. But unless it was an academic path or something that involved exams, you're kind of out the window. And the Prince's Trust at the moment are really trying to focus on those soft skills. So skills... You know, general etiquette, walking into a room and, and and presenting yourself well and, you know, talking about yourself passionately and your passions passionately and, and people seeing drive and, and enthusiasm rather than, oh, I can see you've got five A-levels and a degree in whatever, to really encourage kids that don't feel so academic in, in other areas. Because, of course, loads of business plans and, and areas of work don't require GCSEs or A-levels. I mean, I'll certainly don't, but there's lots of other ones that don't as well that you can really throw yourself into wholeheartedly. And that's not wrong. That's not a bad choice in life to do that. And there's countless stories that emphasise that point. But I think, you know, it, it's looking at young children, that's the way where there's going to be there's going to be change. I think, you know, we can change ourselves now onwards, but I think really it's the kids. And I think they're a lot savvier than we think as well, you know, especially around social media. A lot of parents have fears that their kids are going to go off and do all sorts of crazy stuff. And I think more often than not, they're quite sensible and they are living it more than we are. So they know the pitfalls more than we do. By the time <coughs> our kids are teenagers or our younger children, at least, um, I reckon social media would be like cigarettes. Yeah, they'll so go, they'll oh, go You're not allowed they used that. to do that. Yeah, yeah. That was so destructive and they used to do it willy-nilly. What about how you're <coughs> coping with the basics of, like, my children are so young, I don't like the idea of having to go, like, well, you know, one of them goes to a little play group or whatever. I worry about people talking to them, touching them. Mm -hmm. like, I don't even mean in any untoward way. I just no. mean simply brushing past. <coughs> yeah, out of but, the home. <laughs> yeah, I, how are mm -hmm. you coping with that? All right, because down, um, again, boys. I think, yeah, I think weirdly a natural 
evolution happens as you grow into parenthood where it is, I've seen with my husband who's got two older children who are 13 and 17, it is an incremental process of letting go. So, you know, at the moment, my stepson who's 17 is learning to drive. So Jesse's going through this whole thing of he's in a car right now and I'm not with him and he could be going at 60 miles an hour and you have to let go. So from the point that we're at with young kids now to 17, you gradually, you know, they go to school. They have their own friendship groups. They're having conversations we don't know about because they're just chatting at playtime. Then they get that bit older. They're going out with people that we don't know and socialising in places we've never been to. So I think over time, you have to learn to let go. And that's, I think parenthood if you if you have kids can really mirror a lot of lessons we need to to learn and um, sort of throw them back at us reflect them back at us so letting go being one of the biggest ones we need to do in life and again that goes back surely to sort of hope and faith having hope having faith in the good something bigger than us not trying to be micromanaging everything because we think we're in control letting go is so tricky but then allows us to open ourselves up to hope and positivity and knowing that, you know, your little ones might be at playgroup, but they're absolutely fine having a great time and they're learning about life while they're there. Um, So as challenging as parenting is, um, it's obviously wonderful as well, but as challenging it is, I think you can use those challenges to teach you as an adult about life itself. And I'm starting to see those patterns and work that out a bit more now. Yeah. Are you controlling? Mm, yeah, I'm bloody. quite controlling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very, you like a bit of the old control, eh? Yeah, I feel safe when, um, like, for instance, in my house, in a very sort of small way of sort of describing this, um, everything has to look how I expect. So it might not be someone else's neat, but for me, it makes sense. And if I come home and everything's all over the shop, I can't do anything. I can't even make a cup of tea, have a piss, whatever, until that house looks how I need it to and how I expect it to. And then I feel like I'm safe. And it's like I can really notice, I feel there's this thin veneer between civilised life and absolute chaos. Wow. And that home equals to me the structure I need for like, I'm okay. It's not going to shit. Everything in my life is okay because the house looks normal. And then that is magnified in to all areas of my life, my job, um, possibly my marriage at times. I'm sure Jesse would back that up. But I like how I like things to be how I expect them to be. And it's not always the norm for anyone else, but it's how, it's what I'm expecting to feel that safety. But then that also hinders you from learning because you're just getting what you what you expect at the end of the day. The, we need this order to feel okay, that yeah. the order makes us feel safe. The house is how we want it to be. The mm. work is how we want it to be. Mm. Listen, this thing my therapist said the other day, he goes, we have to learn to be in comfort living on the edge between order and chaos. He mm. says, if you go too far into the world of order, tedium, yeah. boredom, too far into the realm of chaos, no form, no meaning. We have to be at the edge of it. You have to learn to be able to hold that edge of chaos, which again, I think re- it requires hard. that faith idea that yeah. it's going to be all right to like, you know, I, I know that you've stopped doing some of the TV shows you used to do. And like, you know, that takes sort of a degree of trust totally. and letting go and invite in the possibilities. Right. OK, I'm going to move into personal development and self-help. Yeah. You know, like you have to have that effect. Like, I'm sure people listening will go, oh, you know, if you leave Radio 1 or Celebrity Juice or whatever, that's, you'll be all right. You know, you've been working for 20 years. No, wait a minute. I've, there's no security. I've got nothing back. In. No one's going to help me if I fall. No one's going to go, oh, don't worry if you don't ever work again. We've got this. I've got to keep momentum and keep yeah, it going. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it is risky all the time. And I found a weird piece in that chaos of not really knowing with work but my real life I struggle more with so I'll get into weird bad habits of and I'm quite superstitious as well so oh oh, yeah yeah it's not good what superstition that's the problem with the spiritual thing is it can Mm. especially with this control you can go into like the twitchy no oh no that's gotta be there that's gotta be there like my wife one two three one two three (laughs) weird tips (laughs) you can and mine probably work at more of a subterranean level but i notice them what are you they please well they could be small things so i mean if i'm feeling naturally 
or by circumstance, very stressed at a point in my life or, or there is actual chaos going on or I've had people that have fallen ill around me and it's really stressed me out, obviously. Um, I do get a bit, oh my God, I can't, nothing can be on the floor. And if I walk out of the room and I've spotted a sock, my head will go, better pick that sock up, otherwise you're going to die. It's that extreme. <laughs> it's That's that the sock extreme. of death. The Someone's got to get yeah. that picked up. And I can't not get it. There's no way I could go, don't be ridiculous, yeah. rationalise and go up the stairs. I have to get that sock. But that's when I'm in a, a more vulnerable, not such great place. But right. in everyday life, um, my sort of safety might be I like to get into bed early. So at half nine, I want to be in bed. I love reading in bed. I feel I've worked it out recently. I feel such peace because nothing can really go wrong. And in my everyday life, like with you now, I might say something wrong and I might go have to ruminate about it for five hours after we finish this podcast. Don't use anything. I hope not. We could cut it. Good. Or if I go and even just chat to a friend and I might say something that came out wrong and I might have to worry about that after. But when I'm in bed reading, I can't fuck up. So I feel such peace. But then I get into a bad habit of, I've got to be in bed by half nine reading that book. I've got to be in bed. Otherwise, I won't get enough sleep. I don't know what the worry is. And then I start to not, like live normally I'm then the, not... the neurosis migrates and attaches to even a healthy habit yeah because I suppose in a way I've been thinking a lot about how even neg- negative what we perceive as negative things have positive attributes to them well, I've not been thinking about it someone told me it that's the honest <laughs> truth it was my therapist like fear he says has wisdom in it because fear is awareness mm. so if like you're feeling fear you have to wait for the wisdom like you were saying sometimes you have to learn to sit with it for a little while I always need to connect with someone because I was like a too mental same yeah anger is energy and like it's good to have some anger if you feel that something isn't going the right way if you've been treated badly again I always get a second opinion before I go raging forward on a quest or crusade <laughs> and even grief is mm. he is like the process of healing you so there's wisdom in all of these things but I can see like as a per- like when like as we've like discussed that. before it's good and mm. like uh, I'll, maybe I'll copyright it before he has a chance <laughs> to um, like um like that when you believe in a kind of spiritual life meaning the unseen world the world that cannot be measured the world that does require faith then that can lend itself to sort of like mad superstitious stuff to try and order it because even at the most institutionalized level like there's no you know what the, is the reason for wandering up and down a church with incense or the for the crucifix or the eucharist or for whatever practices are popularized in islam or buddhism or whatever like you need to physicalize and demonstrate these practices somehow you need to make it rational so that you can recognize i'm in communion with some other world and like when we don't have a spiritual tradition to refer to we have to make one up Mm, i guess it's when like rituals become superstitions and what the fine line is there of you know some things we might do because they do bring us comfort and it does uh and i think rituals Mm. are lovely you know whether it's your you have to make your coffee a certain way in the morning. Like you can rather than beat yourself up, like, God, I'm so boring. That I do the same thing every day. Go, this is my little thing. And I'm going to really enjoy every bit of making it and sort of turning that on its head. But I guess when it does hinder you or it becomes a problem, um, and I guess that's something that you would be much more knowledgeable, knowledgeable about than me, because when does something that you really enjoy doing lots mm. turn into an addiction? I've got this little ritual that relaxes me. What I do is I take some heroin <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. all day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's really working. Yeah. So we can clearly see that is a problem. <laughs> but when it's kind of that grey area of, is it a problem? Am I making it a problem? It's quite confusing. The thing, this other thing that my therapist said, that sounds like all I do is do therapy. And the reason for that is, is that is all <laughs> I do. Right? Like he said, like you have to watch for going active like you have to sort of like in this moment i'm all right i'm talking to you i feel safe you're going to chat to laura after it all feels like i know like where i am yeah. it all feels cool and i don't feel like you know, threatened going what would happen if, if i get a text on my phone there's a story about you in a room yeah <laughs> yeah you know, then, then like now like in that moment i've got to like uh, go okay right but how now. how do you do that how do you not react and... My, well I, the answer is i don't know but <laughs> the, but, the, but the method is apparently that your connection to through the you know whether it's through personal rituals or prescribed rituals has given you such a faith and understanding of the deeper levels of reality that your belief that even though temporarily in this moment that is threatening 
I know okay. that I'm going to be all right. Or, or mm. Harry Hill once had a heckle come back. That was, uh, you may heckle me now, sir, but I am safe in the knowledge that at home I've got a roast chicken in the oven. <laughs> <laughs> That's, but for us vegetarians, that doesn't what, even yeah, hit the Well, they can't eat spot. that. It's going to smell nice, but I'm going to feel terrible. I'll recognise the shape of it. I've seen check-ins now. It's going to make me feel guilty. Um, but yeah, it's an, it, that is, it's an interesting one because I think there's something very important about the pause that you mentioned a moment ago, whether that be uh, due to fear or anger or even um, something you really want, um, you know, delaying gratification and, and going, wait a minute, you know, I think I want that biscuit or whatever it might be. It's usually a biscuit in my case. Yeah, um, keep coming why? Up. Like, why is, what, why? You know, and sit in that before, and not with everything like, I must sit here and wait 10 minutes before I eat my dinner, but with things that you know are sort of impulsive or a reaction. Are you an eating disorder person? Um, I think I've definitely... Didn't you be a dancer when you were a dancer when you were a kid? Yeah. Uh, surely they're I hand was. in hand. Weirdly, at dance school, absolutely fine. It was a really beautiful community. Uh, and I talk about it a bit in quiet because it was probably the anomaly. It was like a really amazing um, gang of us that just all loved each other. And there was there was nothing negative about it. It was like a beautiful little bit of my life. Um, I think being on the TV probably gives you a, scent, a sort of a dysmorphia of sorts, for sure, because again, you are open to commentary at all times um, and people comparing you or whatever. Um, so I think I've had confusion around... Um, more what I look like over mm. the years and um, and finding peace with that has been, yeah, challenging and sometimes still is. You know, I'm not like, yeah, I'm really at peace with my body and I uh, really abused it in my 20s, but now I'm really in love with it. No, I have loads of days where I think I don't want it to look like that. Why? And, it, you know, to anyone else, I might just go, well, you're slim, what are you moaning about, whatever. But it's not really about that. It's sort of a, it's more of a feeling and I'm... Um, and I'm not feeling probably how I look to anyone else, and that's yes. the disconnect. I'm learning how complicated uh, body positivity and identity is. I feel like it affects both sexes, but oh, for it sure. seems that there's been so much overt and continual pressure on females that it's been uh, ingested. Yeah. It's like difficult to separate That's forever, it from isn't self. It? It's historic. It goes back, like you look even at you know sort of uh, Tudors or Victorians and how the shape of the woman was so integral to their identity and that silhouette and men not so much. You know, it's always been very much the female body, which is a magnificent thing. And my God, like yes, let's all look at how beautiful it is. But that oh, in actually, turn, I've had to stop doing. You've that. had to stop doing that, so we won't talk about it too much. But I think you, you, for women, there is then therefore obviously a pressure. The caveat to that beauty is there is a pressure to feel like you have to fit into a certain uh, area or body type, whatever. To again, go goes back to to feel okay, and just to feel okay with whatever is going on physically mentally cir circumstantially um is really hard and i think it does involve a bit of the hope we've talked about it does involve a bit of daily discipline and the rituals we've talked about whatever that is yeah, it could be discipline. going for a run you know people don't want to hear that feeling okay or you know happy isn't about read this book and you're gonna feel happy it's so not that saccharine sickly thing it's it's about not going into the darkness and feeling okay and it, people don't want to hear that that involves discipline that's no. boring people want to go tell me a diet i can do tell me what three things i should do each day so i can feel happy or tell me how to get that brilliant job so i can feel happy or how do i get that man so i can feel happy or whatever it might be they don't want to hear that it involves quite boring daily discipline possibly um having to make a few changes in how you live your life people don't want to hear that because it's hard and it's boring it is hard it and works. boring the 12 step thing is actually so when you get to the nitty gritty it's such a serious thing yeah. that's essentially saying let go of all your ideas of what you think you are yeah. and what will make you happy mm. and recognize that it's an invention mm. and that in fact like increasingly i'm beginning to recognize that focus on purpose instead of contentment think of like you know like yeah that's and, nice and I've, I've been do, trying it for a little bit and it's working quite well like so sort of, so often i think you know all right you know 
what am I engaged in in this moment? And you think, you're helping that person. I mm. mean, oh, good. Right mm. then I saw, and actually, I think purpose can bring contentment, but contentment is too easily mistaken for pleasure distraction yep. for me anyway because i will go the biscuit route and where i'm at, at the moment is i'm trying to having like one day at a time had the drug addiction and the alcohol addiction removed and the obsessive behaviors around sex and some of the negative behaviors around relationships i'm looking at i start to think of anything any behavior that i can control that i don't like is be willing to let go of it pray yeah. in my case to like let go of it and it's sort of it's really helping me. It's really helping me to think, all right, I don't ha- like, if I don't like that, uh, say a small thing, like, oh, I think I'm being too sycophantic around people if I think they can give me something. Don't do that now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just think no one's going to be able to give you anything. I, like, I have to continually remind myself no one's going to be able to give you anything. Mm. It's not coming. There is not going to be, like you said with the moment of, you know, because I suppose like you, I've had that. I've had, you know, you're a penniless drug addict. And now... Hollywood! <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, it's, like, it's like you keep thinking that life's yeah, going to yeah. do these things to you. And sometimes I have to be careful that even enlightenment, like I want enlightenment, yes. that really what I mean is I want to feel good. Mm, you know, that exactly. Is the same as I want to go to an orgy. It's like yeah, just yeah, yeah. another pleasure seeking. But are we ever going to even get to that place? No, because it's a mental, it's never a thing, is it? It's a, it's a headspace. And I think we just keep getting bits of it and then it goes again and then we get bits of it and then it goes again and we just get older and learn more and we never reach this place where we go I feel amazing and that's it for me for the next 30 odd years of my life until I pass away I'm gonna feel fucking great and content I don't think that unless you are you know the Dalai Lama or whatever it's unlikely any of us are gonna feel like that so it's learning to ride it and I will say this Dalai Lama he's been like from about four or five years old they've been teaching him that like because he's like they go around don't they looking for Mm -hmm. the reincarnation of the previous one then he's in a monastery where they remove all distractions and everything. Then to this day, he spends eight hours meditating. Now, I'm not suggesting that Dalai Lama's not a special person. Yeah, he's sure. like well easy. He's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's obviously, you know, he's holiness with Dalai yeah. Lama. But the fact is, is that all people I know that are at like sublime levels of spirituality are dedicated. It's their and as life. You say, yeah, it's their life. It's they're their not life. doing other stuff like, oh, I'm going to be at Westfield, so I'm going to pick up yeah. the telly. And they're also not doing it because they want to feel that enlightenment. They're doing it because they know that that, again, is their purpose. And that's, yeah. that's what they're there for, to emit that light and to inspire or to help. And it's it's that. And the, the enlightenment is probably like a secondary thing, I'd imagine. Right, right. Like a, a cherry on a cake. I think you might be right. That it's a sort of a glazed cherry <laughs> enlightenment. Glass-y that's cherry. perhaps the most diminishing thing I know. <laughs> anyone's <laughs> ever said. That's the bit we'll edit out. Yeah. <laughs> Russell, yeah, could you get... There's a bit where I said that enlightenment is like a little tidbit in a cocktail. (laughs) (laughs) Mr. Kipling's transcendence. Um, But anyway, though, that Dalai Lama, he's been like... Or anyone that's been brought up with an enlightenment tradition from their early life when we're being told, you know, if you make loads of money and look a certain way, you will feel happy. They're being told, you're going to die. Everyone you know is going to die. Nothing's permanent. You better... Get used to that. Yeah, right. I think you have to be a real maverick in <laughs> normal everyday life to buck the trend of of listening to what you're being told and, and to stop believing it because we are all told that. Even if it's on subliminal levels of TV, advertising, whatever, that's the same message essentially. Yes, it is. Uh, and I think you have to be serious, amazing maverick to move away from that and go, actually, I don't fancy that. I'm going to do my own thing over here. With your children, can I just say, I'm thinking of, I better run this by Laura first, of like, <laughs> I'm thinking of like, say like when we see dead things, like mm. pigeon or whatever, I'm going, right, Mabel, that's a dead thing, that happens to everyone, all right, so just so you know. Yeah, <laughs> what, I think, what's you know, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, um, well, I'm coming across all these sorts of moments now, because my, my boy is six, and I get lots of very interesting questions about birth and death and um, my husband's mum died about 13 years ago and uh, we talk about her all the time it's almost like she's here so they talk about Nana Chrissy like it's their other grandparent although they they've never met her Um, and I sort of add some flourishes here and there about you know there's this nice sunset Nana Chrissy's painted us a nice sky and things like that and but I think talking about you know, death and or people that aren't here or the realities of life. Um, yeah, I think we need to somewhat sugarcoat some things when they're sugarcoat really tiny. 
a bit, but I think being honest is very valuable to young children so they can understand because I've noticed with especially Rex, he's a real bundle of energy. And if he's frustrated, it's usually because he doesn't understand something. He doesn't understand why someone was mean to him at school. He doesn't understand why I wouldn't let him have a biscuit, whatever it is. And I think that honesty is the bit that that he needs. So I think there is something in that. Um, Mm. I guess it's just how you relay that information. Fern, we've got to wrap this up. I'm really grateful to you coming here. I'm really grateful for the contribution you've made to the conversation around spirituality and personal development for your books, for your podcast. I, I love Happy Place. As you know, we've already plagiarised bits from it. <laughs> Notably, the uh, reading out. The intro bit. Yeah, tweets, yeah the intro. We've just nicked that. Yeah, but yeah, I that's s- good. I'll go we'll have go that. S- have you heard the thing at the beginning of Ferns? Yeah, we'll do that. We'll have that. We'll make ourselves sound really good reading out positive tweets. Ferns only done one podcast. Yeah, just nick it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm absolutely fine with it. This is all sort of like podcast cross pollination, so I think it's it's healthy. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you don't need help, but yeah. Ferns um, using actual skilled broadcasting experience and production. (laughs) Yeah, we should do that. Let's use some actual production values. I like that. Thanks a lot. No, thank you. Uh, Thank you for letting me come on. It's um, I love your podcast, so it's been a joy to be on it. Oh, brilliant. Thank you.